welcome. Today my AJM interview is with Professor Melanie Bryant and Associate Professor Vaughan Higgins, both from University of Tasmania. The topic of today's conversation is their co-authored paper in the Australian Journal of Management special issue on Grand Challenges. The title of their paper is Managing the Grand Challenge of Biological Threats to Food Production, the Importance of Institutional Logics for Maintaining Australian Biosecurity. Here is the interview. Welcome Melanie and Vaughan. What are the key insights for industry policy makers and or employees from your paper published in AGM's special issue on Grand Challenges? So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the perspective from the management discipline, and then I'll pass to Vaughan to talk a little bit more about the biosecurity aspects. Um, so to start with, I think the reason that we're attracted to this particular special issue is that as a management academic, I've been working a lot in the cross-disciplinary space. And, and I remember going to an ANZAM conference a few years ago where we had Jerry George, who's currently at NUS, talking about the importance of management to contributing to grand challenges. So that's been a real, I guess, passion and interest that I've had about how, as management academics, do we actually start to think about um, branching out, I guess, a little bit from the more traditional kind of narrow disciplinary approach to thinking through how our theoretical and practical knowledge can actually influence and and I guess um, contribute to solving these kind of grand challenges or societal um, kind of problems. So I guess um, so I guess the key message from a management perspective, Probably I'm thinking of it more of an industry level. So it's really thinking through um, how from an industry level can we start to draw upon people with different disciplinary backgrounds that we wouldn't normally draw upon. So obviously in this case, management. Uh, I guess for a grand challenge such as biosecurity, we tend to focus on um, scientific knowledge, but we tend to, to be, I guess, you know, drawing upon that social science or management knowledge I guess is not something that people would naturally gravitate to. So I guess from an industry perspective, that's something that we try to promote. Um, the other thing I think from an industry perspective, the second key message from, from for this paper is thinking through the notion of institutional logics. Um, often when we're trying to, to change a culture or we're trying to solve a problem in industry, we think about it from our perspective in terms of our organisational perspective, which is very natural and very normal to do. But we don't often recognise that there's a whole lot of different uh, logics at play. So the historical uh, barriers, if you like, um, you know, the historical or cultural aspects that, that guide the way that we behave, the way that we go about our action. And Vaughan will give some examples of that as we go through. So I think it's really important to think through when we are trying to work with other agencies or organisations to solve societal problems, how are each of the different agencies and organisations coming together? But Vaughan, I might pass to you to talk about the industry and policymaker perspective. Yeah, sure. So look, <clears throat> Uh, as Melanie said, I guess uh, the sort of key insights um, that I see um, from our paper is uh, I sort of see very much from it for, from an industry and policy kind of perspective. So um, I, I guess a starting point is that, that um, a lot of the um, previous work that's been done around this area has been really important in terms of identifying um, challenges and achieving um, shared responsibility. I guess the institutional logics approach that we um, apply in the paper, it, it provides some pretty um, critical uh, insights into how shared responsibility approach can actually work in practice despite these sorts of um, challenges. So um, our contribution is twofold. Firstly, um, we show that uh, the implementation of shared responsibility is characterized by multiple institutional logics. So we talk about a number of these in the paper, such as um, neoliberal, productivist, um, agrarian at a subnational level, um, neoliberal and protectionist at a national level, and also trade liberalization at an international scale. So obviously, um, in many ways, these multiple logics do create tensions and challenges um, for those who are involved in implementing biosecurity. But, uh, and this leads into the second, uh, my, my, my second point, is that um, actors do actually find ways of um, managing those multiple logics. And we refer to that in the paper as logic blending. I guess um, one example of logic blending would be um, where uh, farming industries um, who would 
ordinarily draw upon a product productivist logic, which is, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, in, ensure that um, there's adequate um, adequate international markets for their produce. Um, so if we, it's, we, we're, we're farming industries and the Australian government um, are faced with a disease threat that creates, I guess, both a perceived biosecurity risk and also market competition for Australian agricultural production. So in, in those sorts of cases, we would say that um, this can lead to a process of what's called um, mutual adjustment around um, a, a, a blended logic. So whereas, um, uh, whereas um, <clears throat> prior to a, this particular event occurring, there might be divergent logics um, where there's these events that lead to a convergence um, a, a around particular disease threats or um, and and also um, m market competition, then that can um, lead to a particular situation where there, there's the possibility for, for logics to become uh, blended and actually to work in the same, same sort of way. I guess another good example that we raised in the paper too is what's called the import risk assessment process. This is the process which Biosecurity Australia applies for um, any anything that's um, imported um, into the country of plant or animal nature. Um, we, we, we argued in the paper that this process um, actually, um, e even though it's seen as um, fairly sort of mundane or technical sort of process, it's actually pretty important in terms of enabling um, different logics to be assessed within a single space of calculation. So what, what I mean when I say that is it actually helps to um, restrict controversy over um, differences between what would be otherwise divergent logic. So it brings um, different logics together in, in a shared space of argumentation and, 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 and debate. Now, obviously there's, there are um, issues around that and we tease those out in the paper, but in, in general terms, we think the import risk assessment process provides a pretty interesting example of, 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 of blending. Reflecting about the time when you wrote the paper, and now we're experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic, does the pandemic accentuate and or change the core messages included within your paper? A really interesting question. When I first thought about this, I kind of thought, well, no, things haven't really changed because we're looking at an agricultural context in Australia that despite a pandemic, um, you know, tends to, to be a little bit business as usual in many ways. However, when I stopped to think about this, I think COVID-19 has provided a really good example of, of that shared responsibility approach and how it's been enacted um, in practice. So really what we're looking at with COVID-19, our focus obviously from an agricultural perspective is mainly on animal and plant disease and the impact that that has for Australia. But COVID is really just an example of disease in human health. So it does have a lot of lessons that we can learn that can be translated across to our work. I think um, from a, a COVID-19 perspective, what this has really done to us or done for us rather has reinforced why this shared responsibility approach is important for managing disease and, and um, pest and disease threats but also how governments and agencies can work together and have needed to work together but also some of the challenges that arise from that so some good examples of the challenges um, I think or some great examples first of all of, of the positives we've really seen with COVID-19 how the community has become involved in policing if you like um, you know, have behaviours or, or rules or guidelines around COVID. So you see every day in the paper here in Tasmania, people complaining about people not doing the right thing or not social distancing. You see uh, examples of, of people dobbing in, uh, people not wearing masks and all those kinds of things in states like Victoria. So it's a good example of how the community can actually become involved in shared responsibility. And this is ultimately what we want to achieve in the agricultural space. However, we can also see some challenges, as I've mentioned. So we see things such as federal government um, having a bit of an argument with state government over the approaches that individual states are taking as well. So I'll, um, I'll pass over to Vaughan, who I'm sure he'll give some really good examples um, of those federal and state government um, differences and, and the power relationships that can happen at times. Mm. Look, I think, um, yeah, look, obviously one of the um, 
ongoing challenges that's been noted in various reports with um, agricultural biosecurity is around well how, how do we how do we um, really extend that surveillance from a national level down to a regional and local scale and as Melanie has said COVID-19 provides a perfect example of how that uh, how that shared responsibility can actually happen in, in, in times of a crisis. Um, now, whether or not it takes a crisis to, to be able to um, extend those uh, ex extend those surveillance capabilities, that's another matter. But um, th it's, it's certainly been an interesting example of how that um, that that can occur. Um, I think. Um, look, just I, I guess also as Melanie has said. Um, COVID has provided a very good example of how at you know very short notice um, different different actors at different scales of governing um, can work together um, fairly well around a around a common around a common threat um, that provides some that that provides some really good examples but it can also work um, the other way too we've um, you know had had colleagues who've um, who, who work in the animal health space who have said look um, people from uh, around uh, uh, in, in the with expertise in animal disease um, have actually been providing expertise um, during during this time so um, there's obviously a very you know a very dynamic relationship that's been established then between expertise around um, animal health and biosecurity and also human health as well. So, I mean, that that's another really good example of um, collaboration, coordination that's been occurring. Um, in terms of um, challenges, I mean, I don't think we have to look very far with COVID to to see some of the um, some of the issues that um, have occurred. Um, I guess a really good example is around where um, the federal government has really been pushing. A few states quite hard in terms of loosening of their um, restrictions, whereas state um, governments, some state governments have opted to take a much more precautionary approach, such as um, Western Australia, for instance, um, Tasmania, of course. Um, another ideal example, I think, has happened in the last few days, um, where which has shown that um, there's uh, perhaps um, some some key problems around um, around uh, coordination and that's um, the arrival of um, travellers from New Zealand who then went through to Melbourne, some went through to Western Australia, some went through to Tasmania where that the where the COVID travel bubble hasn't actually been um, um, established. So um, then it becomes a situation of well who whose responsibility is it to actually follow up on these these travellers because obviously it was assumed that all of these travellers would be completing their travel in New South Wales but that clearly hasn't happened so how do you deal with these kinds of um, kind, kinds of situations I, I think that's a um, really interesting question which does also point to the broader challenges around um, agricultural biosecurity in some ways as well despite um, if it's at um, taking a more um, harmonised approach, we will still see situations where, um, where, where, where certain issues may not have been fully um, work, worked out. What are some future research directions suggested from your paper? Uh, and also, if you'd like to share any research that you're working on at this, at this moment. I think, um, well, as I mentioned earlier, we've been fortunate with this project to have it funded by the ARC. So it's a piece of research we've been wanting to, to kind of do for a long time. And I'll, I'll um, let Vaughan talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But I think coming back to the management discipline approach, which is my home, um, again, it's really promoting or pushing that contribution that management scholars can be making to grand challenges. And I'll probably go a little bit further and say should be making to grand challenges because I think it's really important or certainly from my perspective as an academic, for me, it's really important to make sure that that work's applied and it's it's able to be used um, out in society. So from that perspective, I think really pushing 
for or promoting um, the more work that we can do on grand challenges and, and social issues or wicked problems, whichever terminology you want to use. For me, that, that really is a future direction that I think management needs to go towards a little bit more. I know there's some great work in that space, but I think we've been limited to date. Um, the second point I think for me is really getting organisations to be aware of their own internal positioning on issues such as, in our case, biosecurity governance and how this translates into action. So some of the work that we've been doing since we wrote this paper, actually, we found out the day that we did the workshop at UNSW a couple of years ago that we'd actually been successful in getting the funding. So we've, we've probably done about 18 months of work on a three-year project, which is fantastic. And we've been working so far at federal and state government level. And one of the, the uh, findings that we've at the moment is how um, different agencies but also people within different agencies so different actors within federal government for example how they frame or how they define or how they um, talk about drivers for this shared responsibility approach can be very different so we're seeing very common language but at the same time we're seeing very different language um, and how does this actually translate into action and I think some of the examples that Vaughan's just given in the previous question over how agencies governments uh, for example and community work together in in um, you know, times of COVID, for example, if we have a, a big disease threat. Uh, what, what we tend to see is that internal positioning of the organisation obviously taking precedence, which again is, is quite a normal thing to do, but we can start to have problems. So we can start to have those little gaps in terms of who's responsible for what. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing because I think having that space, although those little gaps um, can also provide really creative and innovative ways to start to think about things like shared responsibility. But, um, but I think if we're not aware of those as an organisation that can you know, it means we, we go with a certain perspective and not, not necessarily taking um, into account other perspectives that can impact on what we're doing. Vaughan, I'll pass to you. Mm, thanks. Look, I think, um, I, I, I guess the key issue from our perspective is how does that the framework that we used in that paper apply to um, the, pra the practice of sharing responsibility to different scales. So uh, as Melanie said, our ARC uh, project looks at um, <clears throat> looks at how uh, shared responsibility works in practice ac across different scales of governing so um, uh, international national state and um, regional um, the main focus of this project is around that relationship between national state and regional and um, so we know about a, a lot about um, challenge the challenges around biosecurity in general terms, but not not that really that fine grained detail um, at uh, an organisational. Uh, when I say organisational, I mean both intra organisational, as Melanie said, but also inter organisational as well. So, um, in terms of the range of actors, that, you know, government, um, industry, farming organisations, you know biosecurity stakeholders ac across a whole range of different uh, working across a whole range of different areas so um, in terms of, of future directions we think that um, drilling down to look at what actually goes on in practice is going to be really important in terms of um, drawing attention to um, different dimensions of these intra and interorganizational relationships that um, can hopefully um, provide us with some insights into how shared responsibility can work um, more, more effectively. More broadly, this uh, the blending of logics that I was talking about before, um, a further direction I think is how can we, how can this blending of logics approach be applied to other areas of policy and organisational practice where shared responsibility is the desired goal. And obviously shared responsibility is not just confined to the biosecurity space, it's also used in a whole range of other contexts. So how can the work <coughs> that, that, that we're doing also be applicable in other um, institutional as well as um, organisational settings as well um, in terms of responding to grand challenges such as um, human disease which we were just talking about before or um, you know, climate change for instance. Um, the big question I think this comes down to though um, and uh, I, 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 I guess the question is uh, as I said before do we actually need a large scale crisis for shared responsibility to actually be to, to actually work, work effectively. We know 
through our research that there are examples where it does, but at a large national scale, um, do we need a crisis for, um, for, 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 for us to see shared responsibility working really well um, in, in practice? That potentially explains why there hasn't been that same level of um, coordination around climate change action as what we've seen say around something like COVID. I mean, these are research questions, I guess, but really interesting, I think, research questions for, to, to, for, for academics um, to, to engage with in the future. Thanks both very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you for doing this interview. Thank you. Thanks for having us.